A new commission, a world premiere, an album-length performance by the genre-defined masters of contemporary music, specially created for the BBC's 100th birthday. This is the perfect prom for public service broadcasting, a group named after the very thing that we celebrate tonight. Come with us on a voyage where the band transport us to the birth of radio when it felt like sorcery beaming into people's homes across the land. Accompanied for the first time by the power of the BBC Symphony Orchestra under Jules Buckley's baton, it's PSB at the proms. Welcome to a night of firsts. Public service broadcasting bring us this new noise, a phrase originally coined by the wonderful Hilda Matheson, who was the BBC's first director of talks, to describe this weird, strange sound of the wireless when it was launched back in 1922. Tonight, this new noise is the brand new performance piece by PSB, a band quite frankly like no other. Fronted by guitarist and songwriter J. Wilgus Esquire, with arranger J.F. Abrams on keyboard and flugelhorn, my personal favourite, Rigglesworth on drums and Mr. B on visuals. They have created a completely new way to tell stories. They've written a symphonic score, ferreted in the archives and enlisted guest artists, live, recorded and deceased, including an on-stage performance from folk singer Seth Lakeman and the voice of Michael Sheen. To mark the BBC's centenary, PSB look back pre-television at the first 15 years of BBC radio when words over the ether were a form of magic that changed all of our lives and the world. Now, the wonderful Royal Albert Hall is filling up nicely and someone who is here nice and early and public service broadcasting. Can I call you a super fan, Chris Addison? Yeah, OK. Yeah? I'll, I'll go with that, yeah. How close are we to the spot you watched them at the proms back in 2019? We're, if, we, if we were to go a <laughs> metre and a half there, that would be it. Front centre oh. back then. Yeah, it was great. It was a really good gig when they played through their Race of Space yeah. album. What is it about them that made you a fan that first caught your attention, do you think? Well, I first got into them because I'm a, a, an Apollo mission nuts. So when they made their Race for Space album, which is all about the, the battle to, for sort of space supremacy, I just got onto it and it's, it's as you say, it's a band like no other. The, the way that they marry these extraordinary archive pieces with this fantastic music just got me completely hooked. I love that it's everything they do is, if they said to you they were going to do it, you'd go, OK. Yeah. Good and luck with that. Absolutely. I mean, this in itself, in terms of being given that, that job of celebrating the BBC's 100th yeah. birthday. Uh, but I love the kind they love the challenge by the sound of things yeah. as well. And for us as fans as well, we, I always learn something from them. You know, in yes. terms of like the best way to learn about history almost in a way yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. And that's because they're not dilettantes, there's, there's proper research in it. You know, they go away for a couple of years and figure out what it's going to be and then they come back with this beautifully packaged 40, 45 minutes that that makes total sense. And it's really what they produce is layered and it's nuanced and it's grand and it's and it can be fun and it can be kind of elegiac and it's a remarkable range for what is basically an art rock band. What are you expecting tonight? I, do you know what? I don't know what I'm expecting because that's what I like about them and it'll be fascinating just from a sort of musical geek perspective <laughs> to watch, you know, a band, it's the, it's the Bass, it's the bassist and the drummer yeah. who set the rhythm. Yeah. Not tonight, they've got a conductor. Jules Buckley's in charge Jules tonight. Buckley's gonna yeah. say, Don't be doing that, watch me. <laughs> yeah. So it's going to be fascinating Follow to see. Follow me, yeah. my rhythm. Yeah. How will they deal with that? Yeah. I, I can't wait to see it. But also, you know, I'm a, I'm a big sap about the BBC there. I think, I genuinely think it is the the greatest cultural institution probably in the world certainly that this country's ever produced it's a massive part of our identity in the in the world and it's sort of the air that we breathe you know we've all been brought up with it it's just nice to be able to 
celebrate it wholeheartedly yeah. for once. Yeah, it's so great to have you here. Thank you, it's lovely and to be here. have an amazing time tonight Thanks, with the family as well. It's Thank great you. to see you. Thank you so much, Chris. Now, creating a spectacle from scratch for 86 musicians while delving into the archives of the early days of the BBC is not for the faint-hearted. We caught up with PSB frontman Jay Wilgus Esquire in rehearsals to find out more. I think when we were first asked to create this prom, it was a mixture of excitement and dread because, you know, how do you possibly begin to sum up something as enormous as the BBC? And even before that, just the magical invention of radio. It's one of those things you say yes to and then you work out how you do it later, I think, yeah. Broadcasting is a means of enlarging the frontiers of human interest and... Confidence. The piece is named This New Noise after an excerpt from Hilda Matheson's book, and Hilda Matheson was a pivotal figure for the BBC, and we've, we've kind of focused on some of her writings, some of her thoughts. And Reith, obviously, is such a towering figure, literally, in, in the BBC's history. Reith was the person behind it all, and he had this kind of semi-religious fervour about it. In the spirit of how Reith talked about the BBC being one organism, not an organisation, we wanted to be part of the, the organism that is a symphony orchestra. To kind of put yourself on a stage with these amazing musicians that we're performing with today, it's really such a long way from what I thought this could be and would be when I started out as just a bit of fun. And usually, you know, we're three people from a musical perspective and one from a visual perspective, and we make the whole sound, but here we're kind of, we're just one more ingredient in it. We always try and kind of draw lines from the past to the present when we're doing this stuff, so it's not just an exercise in nostalgia looking backwards. And it's just one of those kind of nice moments where we can show the original symphony orchestra on the screen and also in its current iteration playing in front of it. It's one of those nice kind of little parallels that we can set up. I think when you set yourself up as a band like this, it's very easy to be too kind of self-involved and too pretentious about the whole thing and run the risk of kind of vanishing up one's own posterior. So I think we've always, in a very kind of English way, I suppose, used kind of humour as a defence mechanism and, and self-deprecation as a kind of way of, of deflecting some of that. And, you know, we take what we do very seriously, but we don't take ourselves too seriously, I hope. And I think if we can kind of bring some of those potential walls down between band and audience with a bit of levity in and amongst some of the more emotionally kind of resonant and powerful moments, I think that's a good idea, but I think we'd do it even if it wasn't a good idea. This is extraordinary. This stage is set for PSB's debut performance with Jules Buckley and the BBC Symphony Orchestra. There is a beautiful energy in this room, a mix of excitement and anticipation. Here we have Jules Buckley and Public Service Broadcasting taken to the stage to, well, as you can hear, beautiful applause for the premiere of This New Noise. test of transmission and reception efficiency to determine the sensitivity of the latest type of instrument.
science, comforting man's animal poverty and leisuring his toil have humanized manners and social temper. And now, above her globe-spread net of speeded intercourse, hath outrun all magic, and disclosing the secrecy of the reticent air, hath woven a seamless web of invisible strands, spiriting the dumb inane with the quick matter of life. Now music's prisoned rapture and the drowned voice of truth, mantled in light's velocity, over land and sea are omnipresent, speaking aloud to every ear, into every heart and home, their unhindered message, the body and soul of universal brotherhood. One of the great gifts of providence to mankind is a trust of which we are humble ministers. Our prayer is that nothing mean or cheap may lessen its value and that all its messages may bring happiness and comfort to those who listen.
two important dates in that eventful year of 1922. November 14th, the official start of the company's broadcasting service from Station 2LO. December 14th, the appointment of the company's general manager, John Charles Walsham Reed. someone markedly and patently not of the common run. Someone one couldn't have invented an original. Good evening. Hello. Thanks very much for coming. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. I'd just like to introduce for this next number on guest vocals, please, Seth Lakeman.
at this stage the bbc passes from preparations to programs there are many performers many subjects many methods of transmission through the aerials of the bbc widespread across the country a new medium of education and entertainment is in course of development Right, which 200 kilocycles, 1500 meters. London, 1149 kilocycles, 261.1 meters. North, 1013 kilocycles, 296.2 meters. Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin to Lord Reith. The opening of the wireless broadcasting station at Daventry, the highest powered station at present in the world, will give no fewer than 20 million people the opportunity to receive both education and entertainment by means of cheap and simple apparatus. And I look upon Daventry as another milestone on the road to the social betterment of our people. This is the entrance hall to Broadcasting House. In the Latin inscription which you see up there above the central arch, we have tried to reflect the idea behind our work. What does it say? The free translation would run like this. This temple of the arts and muses is dedicated to Almighty God by the first governors of broadcasting in the year 1931, Sir John Reith being the Director General. It is their prayer that good seed sown may bring forth a good harvest, that all things hostile to peace or purity may be banished from this house, and that the people, inclining their ear to whatsoever things are beautiful and honest and of good report, may tread the path of wisdom and uprightness. 
Yes, I think I rather like that. So do I.
here, putting the world right on broadcasting itself, is Mr. George Bernard Shaw. The politicians have not yet found out the microphone. They still imagine that they are addressing political meetings. And they don't understand that the microphone is the most wonderful telltale in the world. If you speak insincerely to a political, say, an election audience, the more insincere you are, the more hopelessly you're away from all the facts of life, the more they'll cheer you and the more they're delighted. But if you try that on the microphone, the microphone has a certain magic. It gives you away instantly. You hear the political ranter. You hear that his platitudes mean nothing and that he doesn't really believe it. And there's something more important. If you nerve yourself to face the microphone by taking, say, half a glass of whiskey, the effect produced is that you're shockingly drunk. At the present moment, the whole thing's lit up.
to dedicate the music that we've written for this prom to the memory of my friend Rebecca Tule, whose family are here tonight. Uh, she worked for the BBC and she believed passionately uh, in its public service remit, although she was occasionally frustrated by its machinations, as anyone who's worked for BBC is. Um, she was a passionate defender of it, and this is in her memory. She's much missed. Thank you. Uh, we have a slightly different ending to the usual kind of proms fair uh, on offer tonight. So um, we're not going to be kind of coming back on, going back off, coming back on, going back off at the end. So if you want to show all your love and appreciation for our fantastic conductor this evening, Mr. Jules Buckley, please. I have to say, it's one of the highlights of my musical life, um, if one of the most intimidating we're performing of this fantastic orchestra, the BBC Symphony Orchestra, led by Stephen Bryant. We've got, on visuals here, putting together the spectacle you've seen tonight, the fantastic maverick, Mr. B. <laughs> on drums, the hairy Harridan, the Yorkshire Terrier, the furry fury, the one, the only, Rigglesworth. And I forgot him last time, despite the fact he arranged the whole thing. So please, on keys and flugelhorn, and also orchestrating the entire evening for you tonight, the fantabulous Mr. J.F. Abraham. <laughs> we need to thank Charlotte Higgins, who lent us the title of her book for this prom, This New Noise. And I think what we're trying to do with the ending to tonight's prom, not to give too much away or head in a particular direction, is just to ask people to contemplate what the media landscape in this country would look like uh, without the BBC. And what... Charlotte Higgins, in her excellent book, called it the greatest cultural institution that this country has ever known, and I fully agree with that. And I think it's, it's obviously not perfect in so, so many ways. Um, but it's, it's ours, and it's worth fighting for, and no private company motivated by profit is going to put on the kind of culturally vital but commercially unappealing things, like the proms that the BBC does. Yeah, so um, it's ours, it's worth fighting for, and if it goes, nothing will take its place. It'll just be a void or an empty stage, and uh, we'd just like to leave you with that thought before the final two pieces we're going to play tonight. Thank you once again. We've been Public Service Broadcasting. <laughs> it's been fabulous. <laughs> Oh,
we have got to see that what we do is of the highest standard that we can make it. There should be no motive actuating the minds of those running the broadcasting service other than the urge to do the best programs, the widest possible range of material, to the best possible standard that we can produce. That is what we have always tried to do and which we shall continue to try and do. From the very first, our chief executive saw broadcasting as a public service with far wider vistas and obligations than those of entertainment alone. No company constituted on trade lines for the profit of those composing it can be regarded as adequate. We think a public corporation the most appropriate organization. As we conceive it, our responsibility is to carry into the greatest possible number of homes Everything that is best in every department of human knowledge, endeavor, and achievement. From the earliest days, it has been our resolve that the great possibilities and influences of the medium should be exploited to the highest human advantage. service as a whole has been and is dedicated to the best interest of mankind. By wise encouragement of the best in national and international life, by a responsible and careful exercise of its tremendous patronage of the arts, and by its stimulation of the spirit of intellectual inquiry, broadcasting can exercise the most powerful and beneficent leadership. In setting up a system of public service broadcasting, Britain did in fact light the candle will not be put out.
and what of the future? This country has in its hands an instrument of incalculable power for good. An instrument that can be given to spreading among the nations a true knowledge of each other, helpful rather than hurtful to the interests of mankind. These newly acquired skills of mankind move at a breathtaking pace. Broadcasting, which we begin to see now as a worldwide international service, is a step into the future even more dramatic, I think, than the development of flight. Broadcasting without its responsibilities is nothing. It's not a way of thought. It's not a way of culture. It's not a way of life. It's there to serve thought, so that people think for themselves. It's there to serve culture in such a way that people will turn more and more to active participation in the arts. Go to the theatre, attend concerts, read books, use their hands, and help to build a community in which broadcasting is only a very small part of a full and satisfying life. in a type of service which had not been operated before, except on a purely experimental basis, and almost every day we learned something new.
and the whole of my complex, lovely picture, with its voices, its castles, its landscapes, its musics, its men and women, had been painted on the underside of a cloud with a brush full of iridescent vapor. It melted as you looked and listened, and like so much moonshine, it vanished forever. What an extraordinary piece. So powerful, so moving. I mean, if we just think about tonight, how enriched our lives has been culturally from that one performance. What an incredible piece of work from Jules Barclay, the orchestra, and public service broadcasting. Well, all that's left for me to say is a huge thank you to Public Service Broadcasting, Joe's Buckley, Seth Lakeman, and every member of the BBC Symphony Orchestra for that incredible feat of storytelling. Thank you so much to you for watching. Make sure you join us on Sunday night at 8 p.m. here on BBC Four when Chiniki Orchestra performed Beethoven's Ninth Symphony and a composition that won George Walker the Pulitzer Prize. Take care. Good night.